the title of our series is um, Unity and Diversity, an academic community reflects on the three cultures, humanities, social sciences, and natural sciences. The series is rooted in C.P. Snow's famous Reed Lecture of 1959 entitled The Two Cultures and the Scientific Revolution, in which he described a cultural divide between the natural sciences and the humanities. Note that we are including a third culture, the social sciences, in this series. That was neglected by Snow. Uh, Snow's thesis will be examined in its contemporary context and in its application to and relevance for Florida State University. Uh, here are some of the uh, topics or questions that might come up during our series. Uh, how might each culture um, inform and be informed by the other two cultures? Can an interaction among the three cultures facilitate the solving of the world's pressing problems? Can a greater interaction among the three cultures uh, lead to a better university, one with more communication across the disciplines? Uh, should we consider changes to our curriculum uh, to better facilitate uh, communication among the three cultures? And finally, and there may be other points to come up, but can and should we develop venues for greater faculty interaction across the cultural boundaries? Uh, Coleridge defined beauty as unity and variety. If we find a certain unity among the humanities, social sciences, and natural sciences, we may discover a beauty at Florida State University of which we were previously unaware. The first three uh, luncheons will feature outstanding visiting speakers who are nationally recognized experts in their respective areas of interdisciplinary scholarship, one each from the humanities, social sciences, and natural sciences. The fourth luncheon will consist of a panel discussion by four FSU professors. Uh, all of them, I believe, are here today, and uh, we will be discussing um, how this three-culture dialogue may be more effectively uh, realized here at Florida State University. Uh, just a couple of other notes here. All luncheons will be webcast live, and including right now, and also available as an archive. Each luncheon will also be televised by WFSU TV on cable channel four several weeks after each event. Uh, there is a website for the luncheon series that you may have seen, um, and you will see the address um, for that website on the handout that is at each, um, each place today. The, um, the uh, all webcasts will be accessible too from this website. So I think I've covered the, the key uh, introductory material here and I would like to now introduce uh, Professor Megan Kennedy, Associate Professor of English, who will introduce our speaker for today. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Uh, Jay Clayton is the William R. Keenan, Jr. Professor and uh, recent chair of the Department of English at uh, Vanderbilt University in Nashville. Uh, he's the author of uh, three books, uh, monographs, as well as uh, a couple of collections. And uh, I think just looking at the titles of those books shows us how he's an accomplished border crosser and has been from the beginnings of his career. Uh, the first book on romantic vision and the novel uh, the second on contemporary American literature and theory, and then the third on Charles Dickens and cyberspace, the afterlife of the 19th century in postmodern culture. So we have here a, a remarkable uh, range in both time and nation. And in fact, his last book, the Charles Dickens and cyberspace, uh, which explores the literary and scientific links between contemporary American culture and the 19th century heritage it so often repudiates, uh, received the Suzanne M. Glasscock Humanities Prize for Interdisciplinary Scholarship and an honorable mention also for the George and Barbara Perkins Prize for the best book of the year in the field of narrative studies. Uh, Jay's current research involves the ethical and social issues raised by genetics as they appear in literature and films. Uh, he has lectured on genetics and literature at the National Human Genome Research Institute at the NIH 
at the English Institute, the MLA, Narrative Society, Society for Literature and Science, and a number of medical schools. Uh, he has received Guggenheim Foundation and ACLS uh, fellowships. And I think uh, it's, it's evident that whether he is considering the Crystal Palace or a, a H.G. Wells genetic theories uh, or contemporary steampunk, which actually he'll be speaking on in the English department later today, uh, Jay Clayton's work is certain to change the way we think about literature and science. It's a great opportunity for us to have him here, and I'm honored and delighted to present to you Dr. Jay Clayton, who will be speaking on how the humanities may inform and be informed by the social and natural sciences. Thank you, Megan. Is this microphone at the right distance? Excellent. And thank you, Bob, for this gracious invitation. You've been a terrific host, and I'm very happy to be here at my second trip to Florida State University. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to thank the Presbyterian University Center for this, uh, for all the work they did in helping us set up the uh, computer equipment, which I hope goes well today. Uh, so let me start off with two examples of the kind of cultural artifacts a humanist such as myself studies. The first is from a contemporary, a contemporary novel. Did it ever occur to you, my dear, said Pilar, that your mother may have been a guinea pig? It hadn't occurred to Toby, but it occurred to her now. Now promise me that you will never take any pill made by a corporation said Pilar. Never buy such a pill and never accept such a pill if offered, no matter what they say. They'll produce data and scientists, they'll produce doctors, worthless. They've all been bought. Margaret Atwood's The Year of the Flood, the gripping sequel to her 2003 novel Oryx and Crake, was published to great fanfare. The two volumes constitute a dystopian fable in the mold of Brave New World, 1984, or Atwood's own earlier novel, The Handmaid's Tale. They feature not only illegal experimentation with human subjects, but bioterrorism, a genetically engineered pandemic, the cloning of a post-human species, and a world overrun with transgenic animals like the pigoon a human pig chimera with up to five kidneys available for organ harvesting. Atwood's pigoon is not too far removed from current medical advances, like this pig with human G DNA on the cover of National Geographic. Well, not that pig. <laughs> that pig. <laughs> And the rest of the genetic nightmare she conjures may seem plausible enough to conspiracy theorists and the audiences for black blockbuster films. All the same, how do the two cultures talk to one another if literature and the arts typically exhibit this level of suspicion of science? Here's another example. And it, it comes from Will Smith's horror movie, I Am Legend, 2007, which follows the struggles of a scientist who inexplicably survives a genetically engineered plague, essentially a zombie movie with a biomedical premise. It opens with a television interview with Emma Thompson, as amusing as it is chilling, who announces that she has cured cancer. Uh, I hope I'm going to be able to play it for you. I'm going to have to toggle over to my video, and we'll see if you can see it. Uh, Emma Thompson's voice is very low. You, I think you'll be able to hear her when you, uh, your ears adjust to it, but be ready to listen hard. It's a very short clip. Let's see here. The purpose of attempting to show that, uh, to have uh, Emma Thompson, the doctor, announced she's cured cancer uh, with great uh, excitement in her voice. Uh, and then the screen goes black and then fades back up with a sign, that, uh, lettering that says, three years later, and all of Earth's population has been wiped out 
by the side effects of her genetically engineered cure for cancer. Uh, except for Will Smith and a few other survivors who have to fight zombies created by the, by the genetically engineered cancer cure. Um, so, these two works, the Atwood novel, the very popular and very powerful movie, I highly recommend it if you like Hollywood blockbusters, these two works merely scratch the surface of horrific representations of science in both high and low culture. Here are some other images from contemporary culture touching on developments in biotechnology. Some years back, there was the prospect, or at least the claim, uh, to uh, that a group had produced a human clone. In Europe, people are particularly concerned with GM food, what is often referred to as Franken food. And this is from an art exhibit on the dangers of genetically engineered GM food. Or let me propose a final example. The creation of chimeras are a regular occurrence in modern biomedical research, uh, such as this, the Jeep, the goat-sheep hybrid, which is the first true chimera uh, of interspecies uh, grafting. Uh, the GFP mouse, which is a very, many people know about that, very common phenomenon. Um, but literature, art, and myth have been imagining chimeras throughout recorded history, and they convey a very different attitude toward the phenomenon. Here is how Hollywood imagined chimeras in the classic 1933 movie of H.G. Wells' novel, uh, the Island of Dr. Moreau, which for the movie was renamed The Island of the Lost Souls. So, uh, but before we get to that, I wanted to illustrate the definitions of chimeras. Uh, the medical definitions of chimeras are interspecies xenografts of tissue into postnatal hosts. That's from uh, an article in Nature Medicine, as you can see. And Chimeras consist of mixtures of cells, or in some cases, tissues from two different kinds of animals, which is from the IOM guidelines on stem cell research. And H.G. Wells' chimeras in his novel, The Island of Dr. Moreau, perfectly fit those definitions of chimeras, even though they're not created genetically. Genetics hadn't been rediscovered at, in 1897 when that book was published. Uh, genetics was not rediscovered. Mendel's work wasn't rediscovered till 1900. But this clip, it breaks my heart you won't be able to see this clip. Uh, from the Island of Lost Souls, but there you have Charles Lawton as the mad scientist in the Island of Dr. Moreau creating human-ape hybrids and cackling with glee when he says, I have become godlike in my powers. So, let me ask again. How do the two cultures talk to one another if literature and the arts typically exhibit this level of suspicion of the sciences? To answer this question, I want to begin with two controversial propositions and then propose a possible solution to the problem. First, reunifying the two cultures is not a feasible way of bridging the gap between the two cultures. And second, over-specialization is not the problem. I'll get to my pro proposed solution to the problem in a moment, but first, let me say a bit more about each of these initial points. The impact of popular culture on perceptions of science has been studied successfully by a variety of researchers primarily in the social sciences. Communication scholars such as Celeste Condit at Georgia or sociologists such as Dorothy Nelkin and Susan Lindy have analyzed the effects of advertising, newspaper, television, and the internet using survey, focus groups, and quantitative methods of discourse analysis. 
Work of this sort in the social science has a recognized place in the public debates about science and is regularly funded by the NIH, the NSF, other granting agencies, both public and private. The role that the humanities can play is less clear, and until recently there's been little work on our part, I'm speaking as a humanist in this lecture, on our part to test the waters. In 1959, Snow famously lamented the trend towards specialization in the 20th century, a trend which had opened a gulf between science and literature. According to Snow, most literary intellectuals possessed a total incomprehension of science and were natural Luddites, whereas most scientists were utterly ignorant of literary culture, often admitting only that they had tried a bit of Dickens, rather as though Dickens were an extraordinarily esoteric, tangled, and dubiously rewarding writer. In the 20th century, however, there are signs that this split is closing. A change is taking place in the relationship between science, technology, popular culture, and the humanities. This change is visible in transdisciplinary re research projects. Transdisciplinary research teams are the hallmark of today's university. At Vanderbilt, for example, the chancellor dedicated $100 million in new research funds to encourage collaboration across different schools, such as law, medicine, engineering, education, and arts and science, divinity, the music school, and you could not apply for these funds if your, your research project did not cross schools, not just departments. And so the, we had a musicologist that worked in medical musicology and had a massive project that, using seed money, did ethnographies of music in Africa around the AIDS epidemic and teaching and healing through music in Africa. And it was later picked up by the NSF and given major grant money. So it was a successful seed money on the part of the university that perfectly indicates that kind of uh, global health music collaboration. Uh, at Florida State, I've, I've noticed that you have this innovative cluster hiring initiative that are, inter this initiative's interdisciplinary in scope. Uh, Robert Ross's interesting background paper for his, this series uh, lists seven initiatives, several of which seem to me to have real potential for crossing the two culture divide, like the neuroscience initiative, the history of text technologies, experimental social sciences, and the psychology and neurobiology of dysregulated behavior. One of the way, well, both inside and outside of the university setting Targeted research programs like this, which are organized around specific projects and goals rather than disciplinary areas, are the driving force behind contemporary research. This is as true in the biotech universities, in communication technologies, in Silicon Valley, in environmental enterprises, and robotics, as it is of university research. To say that the two cultures are converging is not to suggest that the U.S. will soon enjoy a seamless integrated culture in which literary intellectuals understand quantum theory and scientists in lab coats spend their free time reading poetry. No, it would be foolish to forecast the creation of such a holistic culture anytime soon. But that is not the kind of convergence I'm talking about. Rather, the convergence occurring today consists of professionals being forced to draw upon the expertise from diverse fields to accomplish their goals. Knowledge workers increasingly find themselves drawing on sources of expertise from both of the two cultures. There's no less emphasis on specialization today. That's an important point. No less emphasis on specialization. Uh, simply a recognition that the importance of the importance of maintaining close contact with other specialties. Let me summarize a few points about this kind of transdisciplinary research. First, this is not what we normally mean by interdisciplinary. In fact, I would say it's not interdisciplinary research at all, that I, I'd want to distinguish between transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary. Transdisciplinary research brings together people from diverse fields to collaborate on specific ad hoc projects. 
Each researcher brings his or her expertise to the problem. Each publishes in his or her own field specialty journals in his or her own field. Sometimes these are, heft are multi authored articles as well. Um, the a second point is that you must first establish your expertise in your own field. You must have your, you must be credentialed in your own field before you can, uh, your work can be of interest to a transdisciplinary team. You have to be established authority in the field so that you can bring something to the table before the conversation begins. Uh, th this is really based on a scientific model of research. The sciences are way ahead of the humanities in this respect, and the social sciences are, to a lesser extent, way ahead of the humanities. But e even within scientific teams, I want to emphasize is my third point, that the collaborators do not understand what everyone else on their team is doing. It's not interdisciplinary in that sense where you learn yourself, master yourself to fields. A, 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 a monumental task for any of us uh, and not nearly agile enough and flexible enough to switch from one ad hoc project to another if your ideal was to master the fields, the respective fields yourself. It's not going to happen. You know, uh, when I, I go into medical schools and uh, talk to my wives' colleagues in the medical world uh, who are all research doctors, they don't have a clue. Uh, my, my cancer biologist friend doesn't have a clue what the statistician on his team is doing. He knows that he has to have her on his team. Uh, he knows that, she, that they can together, she can tell him research design uh, it, points, she can say, no, you know, the, the data you plan to collect will not <coughs> yield answers to the questions you're trying to ask. And he'll go, oh, uh, why? <laughs> and she says, you know, well, the math is too hard, just trust me. Uh, it, 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 won't, it won't work that way. So they do design a project collaboratively without knowing how each discipline works. Uh, a fourth point, unity of aim or method or target audience is not the proper goal of transdisciplinary research. Uh, I think it's impossible to try and reach multiple audiences with the same piece of scholarship. I think it's fruitless. Who has the time to read outside of one's discipline? Faculty in science departments and medical schools have little practical incentive to collaborate with literary scholars or, or music, music scholars uh, or history scholars. The study of novels or history or art might be valuable supplements to the education of the medical students and to the treatment of patients, but it's hard to see how it can contribute to the funded research of specialists or medical faculty. There are no professional incentives for it, nor should there be. Innovative research demands intense specialization and no amount of lamenting the old integrated culture will bring that world back again. Finally, you have to be conversant with other fields. You have to be able to translate your findings into terms they can under other fields can understand and bring them together on related goals, but not try to integrate them or synthesize them. So that's how I think the, the ways in which transdisciplinary research differs from C.P. Snow's dream of reunifying the two cultures. Let me contrast this way of proceeding with another well-known dream of unification, E.O. Wilson and his notion of consilience. Wilson thinks reunification of the disciplines can occur through a grand new synthesis of the disciplines. In Consilience, the Unity of Knowledge, a 1998 book, the biologist e Edward O. Wilson proposes that a grand synthesis of all human understanding is within our grasp. The Enlightenment dream is about to be realized. Quote, 
The greatest enterprise of the mind has always been and always will be the attempted linkage of the science and the humanities. The, un the ongoing fragmentation of knowledge and resulting chaos in philosophy are not reflections of the real world, but artifacts of scholarship. Um, and he is essentially repeating and updating C.P. Snow's dream, and I might add as a digression that C.P. Snow was repeating and updating H.G. Wells's dream for, uh, for the exact th same thing. H.G. Wells back in 1901 proposed that we were, saw a looming crisis of specialization and that we needed to teach scientists to write better, and that would solve the problem. Uh, no. <laughs> The basis for Wilson's optimism is his belief that science springs from the same impulse that lies at the heart of ethics, religion, literature, art, and all other humanities. Quote, perhaps science is a continuation on a new and better tested ground to attain the same end. Perhaps, but not, I don't think that's a viable strategy for university reform. Whether or not one shares Wilson's vision, it is easy to identify the literary genre in which he, his book works. Consilience is an example of utopian writing, which has found a renewed market in recent years under the label of nonfiction popular science. It is a utopia that's doomed to failure. I prefer the vision articulated by the Harvard emeritus psychologist Jerome Kagan in his book, The Three Cultures, Natural, science, natural Sciences, Social Sciences, and the Humanities in the 21st Century. The passage Robert Ross quotes in his document, which is on the website, uh, captures the sense of diversity and disciplinary aims that are characteristic of the humanities, the social sciences, and the natural sciences. The natural sciences contribute to our material comforts and health and clarify puzzling natural phenomena. The hum humanities articulate changes in the public mood produced by historical change and implicitly defend an ethical posture that seems appropriate for their society during a historical era. The social sciences try to evaluate the claims of both groups. What I like about this is that each group has its own mission. Each has something to contribute to a transdisciplinary project. But do humanities really have anything to offer funded research pro projects in the natural and social sciences? I say yes. And this is where we come to my proposal for a way of overcoming the two culture split. The solution I would propose involves a new project for the humanities, engaging in public policy work. The humanities have a unique opportunity to make their voices heard in public policy today because of a set of changes in the way policy is formulated in the US, the UK, Europe, and most of the developed nations as well as in international non-governmental organizations such as UN UNESCO and the World Health Organization. Over the last 40 years, the rules governing scientific research and much medical practice have been negotiated through a messy but now well-established process. The negotiations take place in a semi-autonomous semi zone of activity informally known as the policy arena. This arena is made up of ad hoc commissions, working groups, and standing committees convened by professional organizations such as the American Academy of Pediatrics or you know, uh, the American College of Medical Genetics, the NIH, the NSF, the President's Commission on Bioethics, or the IOM. Designed to be inclusive, these bodies are made up of scientists, doctors, lawyers, social scientists, ethicists, increasingly in the Bush administration especially, theologians. They contained representatives from pharmaceutical companies, if that's the area they're working on. They contain patient advocacy group representation. Every single professional sphere in our society is represented on these committees with one glaring exception, the humanities. 
in the hundreds of members that I've examined on these communities, in these committees, uh, they are chock full of social scientists, chock full of scientists and lawyers, and there's never been a literature professor, a music professor, an art professor, uh, art history, history, none. Despite the fact that these committees openly, repeatedly stress the importance of cultural effects uh, uh, in shaping at public attitudes towards science, technology, and biomedicine. So they study culture, they believe it's important, they bring it into their writings, they analyze it, they give their interpretations of novels and poems and pieces of music and films. They do demographic surveys of, on the impact of culture. They do focus group studies. They use every social science method possible to examine the cultural impact of literature, arts, and history on science. And they fund that research and they do it all without the humanities. Now, I think this represents an enormous opportunity for us. Uh, it's not merely something to lament, it's something to change. Let me tell you a little bit about how these transdisciplinary committees work. Yes, I have plenty of time for that. These committees pursue a variety of paths. They hold hearings, they take testimony from additional experts, they sponsor colloquia, they submit their findings to peer review, they publish them in journals, they issue them in volumes paid for by the Institute of Medicine or the NIH, distributed free to the entire public. Um, and it's not uncommon to have rival sets of recommendations on any given issue. For oppressing current issues such as stem cell research, a wide cross-section of these organizations will commission reports. Private foundations, religious denominations, and advocacy groups may also commission reports on the same topic. While scientists and practitioners in effective areas may find this state of affairs confusing for a period, the effectiveness of policy recommendations stands or falls to a reasonable degree on the quality of its insights and argumentation. Inevitably, the process is political, lobbying by interest groups, public opinion, media coverage, corporate influence, institutional priorities, and political partisanship shape recommendations, but it's no messier than any other form of democratic contestation and it has one distinguishing characteristic. At its core lies a substantive debate over ideas generated through research, ideas generated through scholarship and intellectual exchange. It's a genuinely scholarly activity that's affecting public policy. Eventually, policy recommendations may become the basis of state or national law, but here's a crucial point. Whether written into law or not, policy recommendations have the potential to influence practice in their fields and become factors in decisions by funding agencies and courts. Lawmaking is actually the exception in this area, not the rule. Law defines the outer boundaries of what people can do. Within those boundaries, norms of practice and administrative structures shape the vast majority of behaviors. By articulating norms and influencing behavior, policy recommendations make an impact regardless of whether they become law of the land. The policy arena occupies an intermediate position between disciplinary specialists in the public sphere, mediating even as it formalizes the process of speaking out in public. It alters, and, it alters dramatically the type of actors who's empowered to speak about the scientific questions, and I've told you all the people currently empowered to speak, and I think this is, you know, this is, the history is clear, you, the history has been written of the growth of the policy uh, arena. It's new. The notion of the old modern structure of how policy is established uh, has largely disappeared, and we can date it from the first requirement 
for a policy committee in 1966. So it, it's a very new phenomenon, but I don't think that many people in the humanities have absorbed the fact that there's a different way that their voice can reach and have actual effect in the world from the old paradigm of you write your piece of scholarship, you hope somebody reads it, and then you hope that person's attitude is swayed by it, and, and that a large group of them so swayed would eventually elect a, a legislator. You know, that model is not how the humanities can affect the real world. But we do have this other opportunity. The ticket to this arena, the policy arena, is the type of transdisciplinarity I discussed above, a procedure that thinks in terms of alliances among disciplinary investigations rather than mastery of alien realms of thought. The growth of research that depends on transdisciplinary teams has carved out a place for scholars whose area of expertise concerns history and cultural representations, symbolic forms, values, and interpretation. Social scientists have, and have rushed to occupy this space. Humanists could too. Uh, literary studies can contribute in four different ways to science policy. Um, I focus on literary studies, obviously, because that's my area of expertise, but what I have to say could apply with slight modifications to most humanistic disciplines. Uh, first, we can add, first we can add new archives. We uh, whole new realms of work uh, that we bring to the discussion, works that have it been considered in depth uh, by, even by the social scientists? The social scientists who want to assess cultural impact tend to uh, do a survey of audiences emerging from a movie theater about how their attitudes towards cloning has been changed or how their chimeras have been changed by watching I Am Legend. So, uh, so the, we, we'd bring a, a new uh, archives. We also would bring new methods, specifically close attention to the text, which is literature's method. It's a very traditional method that I'm recommending, but uh, it, the, the, the traditional nature of the kind of research that a literature scholar would do in this area is part of what I mean by saying that you need to bring your established expertise to the table. And what we do is we look in depth at the complexity of meanings in a cultural work, the multiplicity of effects that a, a movie or a novel can have on public responses. Um, a th third, a new focus on scientific language. Uh, and there's a lot of work, that work already in, ready being done. I think it's a very fruitful area of inquiry to do literary and cultural analysis of the language and the metaphors that the scientists themselves use in their studies. And you know, uh, scientists are generally quite receptive to thinking about the way metaphor shapes their thinking. They understand that model building is a crucial part of the uh, research process and that models inevitably have their own uh, virtues and constraints and that those virtues and constraints are related to the language that they use as well as other factors of course. And finally, uh, new pedagogical uh, benefits. The uh, one thing we can say about the literature departments in the United States, history departments, is that we reach every single undergraduate. Uh, if, if these kinds of issues were brought into the um, classroom, they would have enormous incalculable effects on a, on a population. So 
you know, even the objection that you have to write your article for a very specialized audience doesn't bear much uh, negative weight in this argument when you consider that the, the specialist ar audience you're reaching is being persuaded to bring such uh, social ethical issues about science and technology into the classroom. In 2003, Priscilla Wald, a professor of English at Duke University, and I created a consortium between our two universities to promote the study of literature and genetics. And we established a working group of 12 literature professors at other universities to pursue collaborative research in this area. We received a $150,000 grant from the NIH and conducted meetings at our respective campuses. It was the first NIH grant ever given to a literature professor. The working group came together with geneticists and physicians to develop pedagogical and research methods for using literature and film to explore the ethical and social issues raised by genetics. Members of our working group consulted with a similar consortium of literature and science scholars in Europe funded by the EU's equivalent of the NIH and began receiving invitations to address audiences in medical schools and the sciences. Many other people are engaging in this project. Uh, I have a number of examples from my colleagues at Vanderbilt and Priscilla Wald's colleagues at Duke, Lenny Davis's colleagues uh, at the University of Chicago, Illinois, University of Illinois, Chicago, all of whom were members of our initial working group and have gone, continued after the three-year grant cycle was over to broaden their inquiries in this area. But I'm going to skip those and just take a moment to describe my two latest ventures in this area. Uh, one is some work for the Institute of Medicine, and the other is an experiment in graduate pedagogy. For the upcoming meeting, annual meeting of the IOM focused on vaccine research and policy, uh, I'm serving on an advisory committee charged with exploring the effects of literature and the arts on public responses to vaccination. Funded by a more than a $100,000 grant from a private foundation, our work will be visible in a multimedia exhibit at the annual meeting of this, in, this October in Washington, D.C., and in the accompanying publication. The other venture is an experiment in graduate pedagogy. For the English department, for an English department seminar in literature and genetics, I arranged for each graduate student to join a research team in a laboratory in the medical school with the goal of identifying a literary work that explored the social or cultural implications raised by the lab's investigations. In the process, the students learned something about how grants are developed in the sciences, how multidisciplinary teamwork occurs in the medical world, and how to generate papers on social, ethical, and cultural issues raised by science and medicine. In the graduate seminars, students explored collaborative research techniques more common in the scientific disciplines than in English studies. The guiding principle behind this experiment was that literary scholars have more to contribute to the realm of science policy than to the actual research of scientists and medical investigators. Vanderbilt Medical School investigators were open to the idea of taking an English graduate student onto their research teams to think about the cultural implications of their projects. They discovered that humanities scholars were more than qualified to understand the ethical and cultural implications of the research, even if the details of the science remained largely opaque. One of the barriers to the interdisciplinary aspirations of humanists in this area is the persistent assumption that our work ought to be targeted at doctors and scientists who have no professional incentive to care about our insights. However, when addressed to an audience of policy experts who are already receptive to cultural analysis, our work intervenes in an established transdisciplinary conversation that has real consequences. A slogan for this new approach might be, don't try to change the science, try to change the science policy. 
Participants in this pedagogical experiment wrote papers on topics ranging from organ transplants to infections, infectious diseases to in vitro fertilization to death and dying. They worked closely both with their literature and their medical school mentors, and in several cases, the, the PI of the, of the lab assigned another faculty member to work with them. Uh, the results of this experiment are on display, I'm happy to say, in the current issue of Literature and Medicine came out this week, so I was able to put this slide up uh, that with a very short introduction by uh, explaining the experiment. Those are two uh, uh, papers written by graduate students uh, about the research they did in their professor's labs, and you can see uh, they're about canonical works of literature, uh, not, uh, not the lab's research itself. These are examples of projects in the humanities that have received funding from sources not usually accessible to our discipline and published uh, in non-traditional venues. They've begun to shift the boundaries of humanities research, but no one from the humanities has taken the next step. No one has begun to translate our work into the policy sphere. That's the challenge I bring to you today, and I want to conclude on that challenge. During the question period, I'd be happy to suggest ideas for how we could take this next step, but now I think I'd best stop and give you a chance to ask questions. Thank you. So if there's a question, and I see there is, uh, Bob really wants us to use that microphone because it's being webcast, and so your voice needs to go over the, uh, the web, not just to the room. And I think he also says that you have to speak up because the mic only goes to the web, it doesn't go to us. Hi, could you suggest some concrete ways for how we could take these next steps? Yes, that's perfect. Thank you very much. Just the question, you'd think I'd planted it. Uh, uh, so one, one of the concrete steps is uh, a, a, an administrative step that can be taken. Um, at, at Vanderbilt, we've just founded the um, MHS program, Medicine, Health, and Society program, which uh, is a wonderful success already. Uh, it has got faculty from all the schools, and it offers an undergraduate major and a master's degree in medicine, health, and society, and it brings together faculty and students, and bringing them together is the key, because you have to learn about your colleagues to begin to look for somebody to collaborate. But in the three years this program's been in existence, it's gone from four or five majors to being the second largest major, undergraduate major at Vanderbilt. So it was an enormously successful initiative. But Graduate training is another crucial uh, step we can take. We need to find new ways to train our graduate students. First, you have to train them in your discipline. You must teach them your discipline, but I think that the humanities need to begin to think about establishing postdocs in, uh, in such policy areas or having PhDs go on to get a postdoc in existing medicine health um, you know, uh, MPH programs or MPP programs, medi medi um, medical public policy programs. Um, you, you know, it's, it's horrifying to think of working for your PhD and getting, get, going all that way through and then going on to a postdoc, but every other discipline does it. Uh, you practically cannot have an appointment, a research appointment in a medical school without a PhD and an MD or an MD and an MPH. Uh, so um, those, are, those are some steps. Once you meet your colleagues through, a, through programs like this one at this luncheon or other kinds of, you can start hearing a, about lectures that you can go to, and once you start going to lectures, you can start meeting your colleagues to collaborate with. Um, the MHS program at Vanderbilt is very useful in simply sending out 
continual notices of everything going on campus in all the related disciplines regarding medical policy? Thanks for that question. Yes. Hi, I'm Micah Vandergrift. I work in the university libraries here. Um, intrigued by the idea of the impact of this collaboration on uh, public policy, and I'm wondering what role uh, open access might play in, in this sort of thing. Fabulous question. Um, first of all, I think libraries uh, have a, a huge opportunity at this moment uh, to, to transform the model of, lib of of their own activities from being simply archives and warehouses for knowledge to becoming producers of knowledge. And the really cutting edge libraries, and I, I apologize for not knowing much about the Florida State Library System, but some libraries up in Boston, University of Virginia's library, not Vanderbilt's library, uh, are on the cutting edge of becoming knowledge producers uh, through their efforts to use information technology to uh, give collaborators opportunities to publish in different ways, uh, to, to publish in curatorial forms rather than, and textual editing forms rather than simply uh, traditional journals. And the key to that is open access. Uh, the sciences, again, are way ahead of the humanities in open access journals. We have very few. They have a number. When I remember the PLOS, when it came out, that's a public library of science. Uh, everybody said, well, hey, who's going to publish in the public library of science? It's an open access journal. You, you just send it in, and nobody pays for it. No drug companies support it. Uh, no advertising. It's you know now one of the most prestigious journals in in the world. Other questions? Well, thank you very much for listening.